welcome. You're watching Head to Head. I'm Antonina Antosha with UA TV. In December 2013, David Satter became the first American journalist to be expelled from Russia since the Cold War. Satter is known in Russia for having written that the apartment bombings in 1999, which were blamed on Chechens and brought Putin to power, were actually carried out by the Russian FSB security police. What threats and dangers are we facing now from Putin's Russia and what should we expect next? Today we're honored to discuss this issue with David Satter, author of the book The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, Russia's Road to Terror and Dictatorship under Yeltsin and Putin. So hello and thank you for joining us. Thank you. You have written about Russia and the Soviet Union for about four decades. Now, Vladimir Putin came to power only 20 years ago, and for several years in a row now, the press does, does not possess any precise information about who Vladimir Putin is. You know Vladimir Putin better than anybody, so could you enlighten us? Well, I've never, I've never met the man, but uh, I think we can judge by his actions. Uh, one action in particular, I think, uh, pretty much sums it up. Which one? Uh, that was in 2004 when Putin, and it could have only been Putin, gave the order to open fire on the school in Beslan where parents and children oh, yeah. were held hostage with flamethrowers and grenade launchers. Mm. Uh, the result was 300, uh, actually, more than 300, more than 300 uh, yeah. hostages were killed, most of them burned alive. Well, who can give such an order? And, and for what reason? Right, that's, that's what I wanted to ask you. What could be the reason behind such a decision, behind such an order? Well, this is, it is power? This, this is it is, the loss for power? It couldn't be. Uh, this is someone for whom I think the the uh, the lives of the hostages had absolutely no meaning, just as the lives of the passengers on board the Malaysian airliner that was shot down yeah. over eastern Ukraine had no meaning. What was important was his own power, and in the interests of that power, he'll do practically anything. Uh, and this began with uh, the, the, the months before he was elected president, in fact, with the uh, so-called elected, uh, with the bombing of the apartment buildings in, in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, people ask the uh, question, who is Mr. Putin, over and over again in the West, in the United States, and then they offer answers that are based on American experience. And if, and the, but the, the, the answer to that question is actually fairly obvious. Uh, it's a, a person for whom moral values just uh, uh, don't exist when it's a question of uh, holding on to power, gaining power, increasing power. Mm -hmm. In the long run, is his ultimate goal to possess power over the whole world? I don't think so. I think it's just to, to, to rob Russia. I think there's a small group of people in Russia who are uh, determined to monopolize power and property and wealth. They, you know, there's only so much wealth that a, certain, that a single person can uh, control. Right. And uh, Russia provides more than enough for him. And, but the, the, the reason why Russia behaves so aggressively and aggressively toward Ukraine... Not only Ukraine, there is Georgia. Well, right? of course. No, there are many examples, in fact. But uh, the reason for this type of behavior is, is that war is an instrument of internal policy. It's a way of, of consolidating control. It's a way of convincing the Russian population that they have enemies and they should rally around their corrupt leadership. And unite uh, in patriotism, trying to defend their country, right? Yeah. Okay, well, um, let us touch upon a little bit uh, on the MH17 crash. I know that you are involved in the investigation process. So, is there any results that you could actually talk about? concern in that case? Well, I'm an expert witness in the case that's been filed in the European Court of mm. Human Rights against Russia and against Putin personally by the relatives of those who were killed on board the plane. 
Uh, and at the present time, uh, documents have been filed in the court. Uh, the complaint has been filed. The supporting testimony has been filed. And Russia was due in early September to, to respond. Uh, they gave a very disrespectful and uh, uh, inappropriate response to the court. And the court, instead of penalizing them and insisting that they follow the rules, gave them more time to answer. So now Russia uh, has until December to respond. Why so? Why the court has not penalized Russia for, well, actually breaking the law? Are they afraid? I think this is a, something that we see over and over again in relation to Russia. Right. That Western, Being reinstated in pace, I mean... Yeah, of course. But I, I think that what, we're, what we see is that uh, Western powers think that it's best uh, to tread carefully with Russia, uh, that they need not, that it's important not to offend Russia, not to offend Putin. Perhaps, they, perhaps there's a fear that if they offend him, uh, they'll provoke him to even greater aggression. But in fact, the, the mere fact that they're not willing to enforce the rules and not willing to stand up is an invitation to aggression. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've seen in a, in, in a lot of different situations. We've seen it in the relations between Russia and Ukraine. Well, that, that looks like, you know, like an echo of the Soviet Union when most of the countries in the world were kind of afraid of the Soviet Union because it was a great union and it possessed atomic power and stuff. How, how deep is the Soviet Union past correlated into the countries that used to belong to the Soviet Union, meaning Russia, Ukraine, the Baltic States? Well, those those countries are all different. The Baltics are different. The Ukraine is different. Russia is different. And, but but the effect of the communist period on people was to uh, uh, destroy the sense of right and wrong, to destroy the sense of of, of respect for the law, mm -hmm. and the idea. Most important, I think, was the idea that the individual is valuable, and that he is a moral actor, and that he's responsible for his his behavior. Mm -hmm. That he individually accepts should accept responsibility for his own freely taken actions mm -hmm. that's uh, that's something that is uh, you know in the Soviet Union the the individual didn't have to think about anything because everything was decided by the government the party yeah absolutely and and uh, and at the same time the government relieved individuals, ordinary people, of responsibility. As long as you were doing what you were told to do by the government, no one would ever uh, hold, would ever raise the question of whether what you did was moral or immoral, mm -hmm. whether it was legal or illegal. Right. So that, that, you know, under those circumstances, and of course, if we talk about Ukraine, we're talking about a country that was under the Soviet system for more than 70 years. Uh, that and that several generations that had its effect on people. Now we have uh, uh, we have uh, free free institutions in 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 Ukraine. We have free elections. Mm -hmm. We have a free press. Uh, in Russia, we don't have those things. So of course, the situation in Russia Russia is much much worse. Baltics were part of the Soviet Union for a much for a somewhat shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. So they had a, their own experience, which was different. Well, like you said, uh, Ukraine is more free now. We do have uh, open, <clears throat> transparent, free elections now we, that we have the new government. Uh, it's like all eyes are on the new government of Ukraine. Uh, the citizens uh, of Kiev, the, the Ukrainians are expecting the new government to uh, come up was an effective way to end the war that's been eating up the country for five years. In order to do so, Ukraine is in deep need of international partners, of their support, like the European Union and the United States of America. Now, concerning the relations, the bilateral relations of Ukraine and the United States of America, there's a lot of controversy around it, uh, especially around the uh, last phone conversation between President Trump and President Zelensky. Could you comment? Oh, it's a dangerous subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but um, I think that uh, uh, there's still a certain amount that we don't know. Uh, I'm inclined to think that uh, what uh, President Trump did was inappropriate because he, you know, if, if there's an investigation that the United States wants, uh, the Department of Justice can contact the uh, law enforcement authorities in Ukraine and ask them to investigate. Mm -hmm. In fact, I believe there's a treaty on cooperation mm -hmm. in criminal matters mm -hmm. between Russia and Ukraine. It's not necessary for the president to raise this with the Ukrainian president, particularly when the person he wants investigated is likely to run against him yeah, in the like next the election. Right. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I don't know, but I, and I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that there was no, no threat mm -hmm. uh, and no deal, that it was just something that Trump asked for. That would be inappropriate enough. If he started making threats or if he, if he said that uh, uh, aid to Ukraine is dependent on cooperation in the investigation of Joseph Biden, who's now you know former vice mm -hmm, president, mm -hmm. that would that would not be a good thing. That would be uh, because he's not as president of the United States. He's really not entitled to use the country's foreign policy as an instrument in his reelection campaign right. or as as a device to torpedo one of his rivals. But I think that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, as we all know, there's a lot going on in the United States concerning this, and I think we'll find out more. Why do you think Donald Trump uh, did not want to join the, for the Normandy format? Well, he, he was may, invited. The United States of America. Yeah, I mean, we can invited. speculate about that, but I think that there's a, uh, his pro campaign program has been uh, based on the idea that America concentrates on America's problems. Mm. And uh, he, he has indicated that he feels that the European powers are closer to uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's something that they can handle. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, it's not clear what difference it would have made if the United States had taken part. Uh, I'm, are, are the Americans better informed than the Europeans? Maybe a little bit. I don't know. I mean, are they more realistic? Hard, just hard to say. The Normandy format didn't get us very far. But... Uh, You're right. <laughs> the Normandy format didn't get us very far. That's why the Steinmeier formula, the controversial Steinmeier formula, has been signed by... Which I believe also will not get us very far. The... Um, the, the controversy around the uh, Steinmeier formula is because nobody actually understands what it means, what's going to happen next. The, um, the only thing that uh, the people were told is that it's going to get us further in the negotiations within the Normandy format. Now, we have signed the uh, Steinmeier formula. Hopefully, uh, very soon we're going to have another next Normandy format meeting. What should be... What should we be expecting from the next Normandy format meeting? I mean, we already know that Mr. Putin is really hard to forecast, right? If there is a question on what Mr. Putin is going to do, then how should Ukrainian government behave within this situation? Well, I, I don't think it's a good idea to base... Uh, Ukrainian actions on uh, predictions about uh, Putin's, rea Putin's behavior. Uh, I think what, what is important is to decide what is acceptable for Ukraine mm -hmm. and what is not. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, if it's not acceptable to allow part of the country to be uh, basically taken over by a foreign power, in this case Russia, uh, either de facto or, or, or literally, 
I don't see how much room there is for compromise. Uh, the, uh, it's sometimes best to insist on the position that you think is right and prepare to defend it as best you can mm. and, and hope that in the future uh, the conditions will exist for achieving your goals. I don't believe myself on the basis of my experience that there can be some kind of negotiated end to this conflict. I think it'll end when it's no longer, when Russia is convinced that the cost is too high. Right. Unfortunately, right. I wish, I, wish I, I didn't feel that way. But that's what I've seen in the past and that's what I believe. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you for such uh, an interesting yeah. conversation. Thank you. That was David Setter. He is the American journalist and a writer. Thank you so much for watching Head to Head. Stay tuned to Wasiwe TV for more.